Hello everyone and welcome to Cine 104 History of Motion Pictures 1945 to present. This is class 13. We are working our way through the 90s and into the 2000s and we're going to start off with this class today on some foreign films off to France and Brazil and Mexico and back around to the US. So let's get going. First up, off to France, and I mentioned France first, and then the title of the film, Amelie, and you'll notice the director's name is down on the fourth line. And so, for testing purposes, I'm not going to ask you the director's name. We have lots of directors in this class, lots of names, including two Andersons, a Wes Anderson and a P.T. Anderson, and all sorts of other directors, and I know that's a lot. So, for a number of these foreign films, uh, I just, uh, I, I hope you like the directors, and I hope you maybe want to see more films by these directors, but don't worry about memorizing their names for tests and things like that. For Amelie, I think the key is, uh, well, it was a very successful film, five Oscar nominations. That's pretty darn good for a foreign language film. And it really does a lot of interesting stuff, including breaking the fourth wall. Uh, there's little bits of CGI in there. Uh, and we'll talk about that in just a sec. Uh, there is narration, interestingly, not from one of the actors in the movie. It's almost like a documentary. There's, there's a person uh, narrating. He, he doesn't appear in the movie. It's a male. He doesn't appear in the movie or anything like that. That's pretty rare. I can't think of uh, a non-documentary that does anything like that. Uh, and the director is Jean-Pierre Genet. And he's fantastic. I love him. And if you like Amelie, you might want to check out some of his other films. Uh, in particular, Delicatessen and City of Lost Children are very much uh, in this uh, style. Even a little bit more, he, he kind of has a, uh, a little bit of a fantasy uh, element to his films. And... Um, just uh, really surprising, I guess. That's that's that to me. That's a high compliment. Is to say I'm constantly surprised by uh, Genet films, and I love being surprised by movies. Uh, a lot of times, I know pretty much where it's going to go, and that's okay too. I I know superhero movies are going to meet an awful villain, and it's not going to look like they could possibly ever survive whatever uh, whatever situation they're in, and then somehow they triumph and that's okay, right? That's okay. It's like a roller coaster. We know it's going to go up and down and it's going to end and it's a fun ride, uh, but we know the journey. Whereas in movies like this one and uh, Christopher Nolan and some other directors, uh, uh, Coen Brothers and so on, you're surprised and you're like, boy, I didn't see that coming. And to me, that's very high praise. I love to be surprised at movies. Amelie is full of those sorts of surprises. I've got a couple of links, um, five links to Amelie. I would spend a chunk of time on this film in class. And what I would recommend is to stop the uh, stop this part of the video. Again, I've probably said this before, but I think that's the best way to do it. That's the way I'd be doing it in class, is that you go back and forth from uh, my PowerPoint slides to film clips and then back to the PowerPoint slides. So. If you choose to go in that direction, that's fantastic. That's the way it would be in class. Uh, Amelie uh, tells the story of a little girl and uh, in the early part of her life, and then the majority of the movie, she's off in Paris, and she's in a wonderful section of the city, Montmartre, and uh, which is where the Moulin Rouge is, by the way. And uh, her romantic uh, 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 travails, and uh, uh, there's a wonderful opening about things that she likes and doesn't like, and and all that sort of thing. It's just really a charming film. For a while, it was on Netflix. I'm not sure if it's back on Netflix or if it's on Amazon Prime or Hulu or wherever, but it's been around, and uh, I would. I would highly recommend it. It's a fun movie for the whole family. It really is. It's a fun movie for the whole family. And as we are diving into a series of foreign 
language films, mm -hmm. I want to remind you that there's a difference between how we get foreign language films and how the rest of the world gets our films. We tend to get smaller films like Amelie, wonderful movie, charming, but not a big budget movie, and we are going to get it with English subtitles. If you are in France and you are going to get Avengers Endgame, you are going to get it dubbed into French, and actors are going to match up with the, uh, the voice actors are going to match up with the actual actors, and somebody who sounds like a French version of Robert Downey Jr., or uh, one of the one of the four Holy Chris's, Chris Evans, Chris Hensworth, Chris Pratt, and Chris Pine. I know Chris Pine's not a, an Avenger, but there are actors, voice actors, in various countries in the world, China and Russia and Brazil, who would do a certain actor. There's one guy in France, and any time Robert Downey Jr. makes a movie, he sounds like that in French. His voice doesn't change from movie to movie in, in, in France. And the same thing would go with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio or Brad Pitt. Usually, especially with the big budget type movies, there is an actor that's closely identified with that uh, American actor, English speaking actor, and they would do most of the parts so that uh, uh, the Leos and the Brads and the, and the Julia's voices don't change from film to film as they are watching them in, uh, over the years, over the course of years. Uh, we tend to get, as I said, smaller films, and I tell you, I think it's, um, I think it's kind of too bad. Uh, the, the, the technology, or the craft, I guess it's more of a craft, has gotten really pretty good over the years. You, you almost don't even notice. They, they, the mouth is moving up and down, and the words are coming out. They take great pains to find words that fit the movements of the mouth. And my personal experience is, I was in Thailand. My wife is Thai. We were married in Thailand and we were over there a few years ago when King Kong came out, the Peter Jackson King Kong, and I had already seen it in English in the U.S. and we were over there around uh, Christmas, New Year's time, and I was out and we wanted to see it. And the next showing was in Thai and I said, well, I, I don't mind. I'll watch it in Thai. It's okay. It's a, mostly it's a big spectacular action movie. I'll watch it in Thai. And uh, and we wa and we saw it in Thai, and the voices were just spot on. It's like they learned how to uh, how to speak Thai. The the actors and the actresses. Jack Black was just a little bit uh, just a little bit off, but everybody else was. Um, it really was surprising. It's like they learned how to speak Thai. It was not uh, distracting in the least. And so I figured, well, if they could do that, then maybe we could get some movies uh, uh, like that. There are some pretty good foreign films to come across, like Amelie. The next one we're going to see, City of God, and uh, this year's Academy Award winning film, Parasite. It doesn't seem like it would have added that much to the budget, compared to how much money the movie might have made in the U.S. if people would have known that it was in English. Now, a lot of people are purists going back uh, certainly to the 1940s and 1950s, and dubbing was not nearly as good back then uh, as it uh, has become. And there were a number of uh, Hercules movies and things like that in Italian and people would make fun of them, the, 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 the mouths would never match, and the sounds, and all that kind of stuff. And, it, and so a purist would say, oh, no, 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 I have to see the Fellini film in Italian, even though I don't speak Italian, I have to see it in Italian, or I have to see the Bergman film in uh, Swedish, and, uh, and so on and so forth. But I think the, the craft of dubbing has gotten so much better over the years. Uh, I think it would be kind of nice to be able to see uh, some of these wonderful foreign films uh, that play here in the U.S. in English. Okay, that's my editorial. Amelie's still a good movie. Uh, you can read the subtitles. It's not that bad. And you might want to check out some other Genet films.
he uh, uh, did an American film, an English language film, Alien Resurrection. It's not really one of his better films. It's a good film. It just doesn't seem like a Genet film. It seems like an alien film. It seems like it's from the same cookie cutter uh, franchise. And that is one of the problems that happens with foreign directors. I think sometimes they lose their personality and what makes them unique when they, especially when they take on a genre or a franchise film. And uh, if you were to take up any number of wonderful directors and say, here, direct the next James Bond movie or let's direct the next Avengers movie or something like that, I think you would lose a lot of what makes them fairly unique. It really depends on the on the franchise people that, that are producing the film. I know that with Star Wars, uh, they had a, a couple of directors and they were pulled off the movie. They were trying to take the Star Wars movie. I'm not sure which one it was. It might, it might have been the Solo movie or one of those. And uh, it, was, it was a team and they were taking the movie in a direction that the producers thought was a little too... Uh, non-Star Wars-y, I guess, if that's the term. And so they were taken off the movie. And uh, I get that. I get that. There's a lot of money at stake in a franchise. And you want to make sure that people still enjoy the franchise. But sometimes it's nice to have a unique voice in, uh, in the film. And uh, especially with big franchise movies, sometimes it can work out. Remember, Christopher Nolan did Batman movies. And you wouldn't think such a, uh, an auteur as Christopher Nolan would be a real good fit for a franchise, but he worked out quite nice, especially with Batman. I think a lot of directors would like to do Batman because it doesn't have, uh, uh, he doesn't have superpowers and there's lots of shadowy things and noir stuff and so on. Tim Burton has also done Batman, so there's that. Okay, anyway, uh, I think these directors do fantastic. I'm not a xenophobe in any case, but I enjoy the movies they tend to make in their native language uh, the most. Now, we've got a couple of um, directors coming up in just a little bit, three Mexican directors, and maybe it's just because they're so close proximity to the U.S., but they have done quite well uh, making uh, American films in uh, uh, English language American films, and when I hear them speak, their English is, is just fine. Uh, very good. So maybe there's that, maybe because they're, they're so close to the U.S., but um, I don't really want to see a Federico Fellini English language film. He's never tried. I know that Akira Kurosawa has tried, and it wasn't really a good fit for him. Okay, next up, we're off to Brazil, City of God. This film has a framing device. We are more or less in the present before we go flashing back maybe 15 or 20 years. It does have voiceover from our protagonist, the lead actor in this case. And it is set in the slums of Rio de Janeiro. And the slums in uh, Portuguese, that's what they speak in Brazil, the slums in Portuguese are called favelas or favelas, not exactly sure. I think it's maybe it's favela. And they tend to have names. So this one slum, and a lot of the slums began as housing developments, government-run housing developments, things like that. And the other slums in Rio are little tin shacks perched on the hillside. And kind of interestingly, I think, in Rio, some of the best property, at least here in the U.S., is in the hills, the Hollywood Hills, uh, and um, in, uh, in Laguna, and all sorts of places like that. Some of the best and most expensive housing is in the hillsides perched above the ocean. And here we are in Rio de Janeiro, and most of the hillside is full of slums. So, I, I don't know, they have a nice view. These places, they, they, they don't look like much, and they're tin shacks uh, for the most part. I'm not even sure if they have running water, but that's where a lot of the slums are there in Rio. 
this uh, film is based on real people and real events, and uh, on the DVD at least you can see the actors side by side with the real people who haven't been killed. A lot of people in gangs are uh, do not live a long life, but uh, some of these people in uh, in this story, luckily I guess for them they got sent to prison and uh, lived uh, into their I don't know 40s maybe something like that. So our protagonist, Rocket, he's trying to stay out of gangs. And that's kind of a universal story. Uh, 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 disadvantaged neighborhoods, uh, lower economic strata neighborhoods, whatever you want to call them. Uh, there's um, a lot of opportunity, uh, 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 gangs, drugs, all that kind of stuff, guns and so on. And if you're a young person, there's a lot of social pressure to to you know, be one of us and, and find a gang and wear the colors and and uh, all that uh, kind of stuff. And it's kind of hard to to say no, no. I want to stay in school. I want to go to college. And it's the same in Brazil as it is in the U.S. or as it is in France, in uh, in in Paris. It's the same all over the world. Some young people who really don't want to go down that path find a lot of pressure uh, to go down that path to to be part of gangs and so on. Uh, so Rocket did stay out. He, his, in the movie, he is a photographer. In real life, he was a writer, but I think writing isn't quite as uh, photogenic as, uh, as photography is. So they changed that minor detail. But for the most part, it keeps uh, to reality and, uh, and it follows this period of the, the 60s and the 70s and 80s, and it has so much style. It, it, uh, it's just a wonderful movie. Uh, the director really does have a way with, uh, with uh, uh, a creativity and style, and I've got one of those, well, a couple of scenes there. There's, uh, let me see, one, two, three scenes there from City of God, and it was so popular in Brazil that they made a TV series out of it called City of Men that was on TV here in the U.S. in, I think it was the Independent Film Channel or the Sundance Channel, and I managed to catch that too, and it was quite good. Okay, so while we're talking about these foreign language films, there is that problem with translation. And... If you speak a second language, fantastic, good for you. I don't speak a second language, and I really uh, wish I did. My wife speaks Thai. I am struggling with Thai. I took a year of French in high school back in Michigan, little knowing that I would end up in California where I should have taken a couple of years of Spanish instead. But, you know, when you're 13, you're not all that smart. But with this class and with films... Translating slang is a real art. And so I put up a couple here uh, in English and in Spanish. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the problems of translating. Now, uh, the first one, and that's the scene from the movie here that we see the two guys and the lady in the car. Etamama tambien. Literally in Spanish, it is and your mother also. And also your mother, something like that. But... I understand from native Spanish speakers that it can also be a little bit more of a taunt, like yo mama, okay? Not a nice thing to say. So how do you translate that? How do you get that meaning across to an American audience or even a, even a French audience, okay? Or, or a Chinese audience? How do you get that feeling across? And another film by one of our uh, three Mexican directors that we're going to talk about in just a second, Amoros Peros, uh, dogs of love, okay? Love dogs, basically. And, but, again, people that uh, know the film, the filmmakers even, and, uh, and native speakers say it. more accurate translation is love's a bitch, okay? And so that's a completely different meaning than love dogs or love's a bitch. Uh, so, a couple of uh, American uh, so, and I won't say English, but American slang, knocked up. Okay, now how do you translate that? Pregnant is a little too clinical. 
right? It's more, it's slang on being pregnant, but it's not pregnant. Pregnant wouldn't be a good way to translate that. And uh, finally, there is American Hustle, and I read just recently that there is no, I'm trying to remember which language, I'm not sure if it's, if it's uh, one of the Chinese languages, Mandarin or Cantonese, or even French, but there is no direct word for hustle. Okay, there's no, uh, there's no direct translation for hustle, and they had uh, trouble translating that. I remember reading uh, a number of years ago when the James Bond movies were first coming out, and th they were translating them into Japanese, and one of the translations for one of the James Bond movies, it might have been the first one, Dr. No, or, uh, or Goldfinger, something like that, and the translate, and it's a great translation, you're going to love this, Mr. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Okay, shooting and kissing. So there you go. That's creative, I guess. All right, so I've been telling you about these three Mexican directors. There they are. Look at all those Oscars they are holding. Okay, a bunch. Five directing Oscars. That's pretty darn good. And they have won five out of six um, for that uh, six-year period. Uh, Inuritu. Baron and Del Toro. Del Toro's on the left, uh, Inirito's in the center, and Cuaron's on the right. I believe I could have Inirito and Cuaron uh, uh, turned around, and I apologize for that. But I love this picture and all those Oscars. Uh, people outside of the U.S. are always aware of how they are seen on the screen, in part because our movies are seen so far around the world, so many people see them around the world that it does kind of present how, you know, how they are presented in the world. Um, and you want to be presented a portrait as uh, evil or conniving or slow or something like that. If it's a big American movie, like an Avengers movie or something like that, you, you want to be portrayed as kind of positively and kind of accurately. And uh, Hisp Hispanics, of course, would want to be portrayed in a uh, accurate and positive way for the most part. It's okay to have a, a villain or two here and there, but you don't only want to be, uh, you know, uh, drug dealers and gardeners or something like that, right? You want to be portrayed in a, in a, in a positive way. Um, but uh, we've got these three directors, and they certainly can do that, and they're behind the camera. They're not in front of the camera, but they're behind the camera, and that is a uh, very important part place to be. So where uh, Mexican director or Mexican actors aren't out there winning Oscars for acting, uh, I think it's very important that they're behind the camera winning all of these Oscars for directing. Um, so... Uh, that's fantastic, really. That's good on them. And uh, there's a cinematographer that has also won a whole bunch of those Oscars. Uh, being portrayed in front of the camera is uh, another matter. Uh, still a ways to go, but certainly uh, behind the camera, these guys are, wow, five out of six. Okay, so let's talk about some of these movies. Uh, Inuritu has done... Amodos Peros, 21 Grams, and Babel, and all three of these films have big casts, kind of a big sprawling cast, not one or two people uh, starring in the movie, but a, a uh, number of people, a big cast. And the film that we see here, Birdman, is shot as if it was done in one unbroken take. We have another film we're going to talk about, uh, I think, in our next class called 1917, which takes the whole idea uh, even a step further because it's a wartime movie. This one has, a, uh, it's very close to reality, okay? It's very close to reality, and uh, that's because the, the guy starring in the movie is Michael Keaton, and the actor he's playing is a former franchise superhero and he uh, was Birdman, Michael Keaton was Batman. So there's all that. That's kind of fun. In this movie, the former Birdman, he wants to 
uh, sort of go legit and, and do more actorly things and less superhero-y things. And so he is in New York. He wants to put on a Broadway play, not a musical, but a Broadway play. And so it is set in this big building where the theater is and the rehearsals take place and the offices and all of that sort of thing. And a little bit outside on the streets, very close by. And it is done, again, seemingly one unbroken take. They have ways of sort of uh, covering that up and, and hiding it and maybe the camera will pass across a white wall or across the sky and uh, that, that sort of neutral shot usually is where or maybe somebody walks in front of the camera and when it's black or white or whatever for that instant that's usually where they stop and do a reset and uh, start the next scene. So uh, interesting film, you can watch some of that. I've got a couple of links to that. Inuritu also did The Revenant and helped Leo get his first Oscar. So that was, uh, that was a good thing for Leo. And the cinematographer Chivo, this is his nickname, the Besky, won his third Oscar in a row for The Revenant after Birdman and Gravity. So uh, uh, good start here. Pretty good for, for uh, Inuritu. Very high quality of film. I'm looking forward to, you know, everything that he does. Next up, and these, these three, I don't know, I don't think they were all in film school together. They're, they're within a couple of years of each other age-wise. But when you win awards and nominations and things in Hollywood, you tend to go to banquets and award ceremonies and things like that. And of course, they would talk to each other and introduce each other and become friends uh, and so on, uh, these uh, three amigos. And that's so cool. I love, uh, uh, you know, the, the sort of the bonding there that they've been able to do and um, help each other out and uh, maybe bounce ideas off, things like that. So Guillermo del Toro often does fantastical themes. Okay, here we are, Shape of Water, this wonderful costume, and uh, th that's not all CGI. There's a man in that um, rubber neoprene suit there. He has used him a couple of times before. Uh, he's a very good uh, physical presence, so when Chibo needs one of his odd creations, I, I don't want to call them monsters, but when he needs one of his creatures, uh, then he uses this uh, uh, this guy here. I, I'm sorry, I don't know his name, but he uses this guy, and he does a fantastic job. And Shape of Water won uh, Del Toro, the Oscar for uh, Best Picture and Best Directing, and check that out. Wonderful film if you haven't seen it. Track it down. And some of his fantastical films, like I said, Blade, Hellboy, Pacific Rim, Crimson Peak, okay. And Pan's Labyrinth uh, has some dr drama. It's set during the Spanish Civil War of the 1930s, uh, and a young girl who has um, a very active uh, um, sort of daydream life, her, her, her active imaginary life, but her, her stepfather is a very brutal uh, person working for um, the, the Spanish government. And so it has quite a clash from the, the, the young girl's uh, imaginary dream world and the real world of the, of the Spanish Civil War. And uh, so this movie is, uh, uh, Pan's Labyrinth is in Spanish. Uh, Shape of Water is in English. I'm sure it has a pretty good Spanish version to it, but Pan's Labyrinth is only in Spanish. There's no English language version of it. And Alfonso Cuaron, Gravity. Uh, boy, do I love this movie. And the opening 13 minutes are, it starts off quite, um, it's spectacular, but it gets very dramatic and very tense as there is, well, what happens is a, uh, the Russians decide that one of their spy satellites is going to be decommissioned and they don't want to just leave it up there. Possibly somebody might go up and 
grab what's in there, their, their their computers and so on that's up there. So uh, they instead of just sort of leaving it there, they want to uh, knock it down and have it go crashing into Earth and burning up. And that goes uh, horrifically haywire. And there is shrapnel and so on up there floating. And the U.S. space station and most of the astronauts uh, run into this awful metal storm and uh, until there's only a few people left. So that's the, that's the setting, 200 miles above Earth, trying to survive. Almost like a, like a life raft or something like that, really, trying to survive and just capsules and things like that and somehow get back to Earth. Quite a, uh, quite a spectacular film. It was really good in 3D, I have to say. Uh, so if he does another 3D movie, I'd, I'd be there. Uh, his next film was almost 180 degrees opposite. He has uh, Roma, which is the name of a neighborhood in Mexico City. So it doesn't have anything to do with Italy. It's the name of a neighborhood in Mexico City. And it was made for Netflix. And that is something we have to address. It was not uh, made specifically for the theatrical experience. A lot of traditionalists would r rather see uh, movie, all movies, any movies, play first in theaters, and usually, and we'll talk about the theatrical window, I'll have a slide on the theatrical window, but normally a movie would have a theatrical window of about three months or 90 days before it is seen anywhere else. So theaters for 90 days, and then that's where you can get into streaming and DVDs and all that other uh, kind of stuff. And Netflix is upsetting that whole tradition and releasing them on the same day and the same date in theaters and, uh, and uh, streaming. Actually, Netflix gave Roma a 30-day window, but it wasn't nearly enough. And a number of the theater chains, uh, AMC and uh, uh, I think maybe Cinemark, they refused to play it. They refused to play it. They say, no, no, that's not enough theatrical window, and that's how we make our money. And if it's going to be on your Netflix so short, nobody's going to want to see it in the theater anyway. And so they were they have been boycotting short theatrical windowed movies. And there are a couple more. Uh, the Irishman, Martin Scorsese, even Martin Scorsese, the sainted Martin Scorsese uh, went the Netflix route. And they, theater chains, uh, said the same thing. that we're not going to show it. So you could see it in independent theaters, but not... Uh, uh, not in the chains. And the, those are big chains. Regal, right? AMC, that's, you know, 80, 80 85% of the country uh, are uh, from the, the theater chains. Hollywood is trying to be neutral on all this. They allowed these movies to be nominated for Oscars and that sort of thing. Neither one of them won the Best Picture. The Irishman nor Roma won the Best Picture. Their directors were nominated, and Cuarón won for directing, but uh, there was enough pushback that it didn't win. And he actually won for cinematography, of all things. He was the director. Chivo Lebeski wasn't available, and he shot it himself and actually won the cinematography. He won three Oscars that night for cinematography. And I think screenplay. I think he won cinematography, screenplay, and directing. I think he won three. Uh, but anyway, I know uh, cinematography and directing for uh, Roma. And those are some of his other, uh, other films. And he also has done an American franchise movie, Harry Potter. And it's a good Harry Potter movie. A lot of people think it's, it's maybe the best. But you don't really feel much Quaron in, <laughs> in the Harry Potter movie. It seems more like a Harry Potter movie and not so much like a, an Alfonso Quaron uh, film. So, you know, I'm glad. And I'll tell you, I, I, I get where these directors are, are coming from. Uh, I would say making a movie in the U.S. or for a Hollywood studio, that's kind of like playing in the big leagues. That's like playing in the NFL or the NBA. Okay, that's, that's the big time. You know, if you're a basketball player, you want to play in the NBA. Now, if you're a soccer player, you probably want to play in Europe somewhere. Okay, you probably want to play in the German League or the, or the, or the, the English League. 
or the Spanish league or the Italian league. Those, those are those are the best soccer leagues in the uh, in the world. But if you are uh, you know foot, uh, American football, baseball, and basketball, that's where you want to play. And I think that's kind of the way directors are thinking of filmmaking, right? If you want to play in the major league, you want to go to Hollywood. That's where you're going to get the biggest budget and the most talented people, the best crews, all that, all the lighting people and cinematography people and all that. That's right here in Southern California. That's where you want to go. So I get the attraction for all that. And you get a big fat paycheck too. And that's cool. But I hope, and again, I don't mean this in any sort of xenophobic way, I hope you go back and make a personal movie. Because when you make a personal movie like Roma, uh, it's probably going to be a better movie, I, I really think. So it, it, you can go back and forth, I think. Spielberg goes back and forth making personal movies and big franchise movies, and a lot of directors do that. And, um, and I think that's uh, a pretty good way to go, really, a pretty good way to go. Make a, make a big, make one for them and one for me is, is what some of the directors have called it. And a, that's a little bit what Guy Ritchie is uh, doing. He is English, and a number of his movies have voiceover and narration. He also likes playing with the technology of film or digital, what we probably would be better off to call it a digital uh, speed change, where you see something at a normal speed and then super slow-mo and then, and then normal speed again, fights and things like that. His fights are, are really nicely done and staged. And, number of these films, there are four of them uh, in particular that uh, have these numerous plot threads. Um, they would sometimes, in Britain they call them the lad films. I guess it would be sort of a guy film or something like that as opposed to a chick flick. I don't know. Um, but over there they call them the lad films. He, he had three and then he just came out with a fourth one after maybe ten years away. Uh, the Gentleman uh, that came out earlier this year. If you haven't seen it, it's fantastic. I love it. These are the films that really put him on the map. Ox, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels, Snatch, and Rock and Rolla. And I've links to a lot of that stuff. Uh, normally I would be concentrating on Snatch. That's uh, Brad Pitt uh, right there. Um, and uh, and uh, Jason Statham, a younger, much younger Jason Statham and some other people you might recognize. And uh, Brad is playing an Irish gypsy, <laughs> and you can barely understand him. And they even comment, even the even the 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 London people comment that you can't understand these pikeys, which I guess is what they call the the Irish gypsies. And so Brad's doing this very <laughs> thick, heavy, crazy, it, and you really need to turn subtitles on when uh, when scenes are taking place uh, with the at the pikey camp and lots of threads, uh, and there's a, a three or four different groups of, of uh, people. It's sort of underworld, not gangs and that sort of thing, but uh, the, the gambling and illegal boxing and that sort of thing. All four of these movies have, have that. Drugs are run through drugs in these couple and, and uh, gambling, boxing, all that kind of stuff. So uh, the kind of the British underworld, not really um, mafia stuff. So a guy, Richie, has been um, uh, alternating those films with some franchise movies. Only one of his franchises is, well, I guess Aladdin. Aladdin, I don't think Aladdin's going to be a, a franchise, but uh, the two Sherlock Holmes movies with uh, Robert Downey Jr. did quite well. But then a big flop with The Man from U.N.C.L.E. and a big flop with King Arthur. And maybe people are thinking, whatever happened to the Guy Ritchie that we used to know and love back in the days of the Lad films? And then he made Aladdin, which is fine, but it's a Disney movie and not that much of a Guy Ritchie film, I don't think. Um, I've seen it, but eh, he, does, he does good with action. He's fine with action, but it doesn't seem like a Guy Ritchie film. And I was so happy when The Gentleman came out uh, earlier this spring, like maybe January, and, uh, and I saw it in theaters, and it's fantastic. I just love it. I've linked to the trailer for it, and all four of those are a real package deal. If you like one, you'd very much like the other three. 
All right, back to America. Charlie Kaufman is a writer, not a director, and very hard to describe. I've got some links uh, for uh, Charlie Kaufman, one, two, three or so links. Hard to encapsulate. Sometimes trailers are the best way. I don't know. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, it's really hard, hard to really describe. You're just going to have to watch some of his stuff. Weird. It often deals with reality and identity. Uh, this film here, Being John Malkovich, which put him on the radar, there is a mysterious portal into John Malkovich's head. Yes. And our protagonist in the film, John, played by John Cusack, he is working in an office, a little awful drone office type job. He drops some, uh, he drops a file behind a filing cabinet. He pulls the filing cabinet away from the wall and he sees a little door and he, very tiny little door, he gets down on hands and knees, he crawls into the door and he's crawling through, looks like uh, dirt and then he gets sucked out through a uh, through the tunnel and ends up in John Malkovich's head. Yes, uh, he can see everything that Malkovich sees and hear everything that Malkovich says. And after 15 minutes, he is dumped out of his head, falls out of the sky, and lands on the side of the road near the freeway. And so he goes back to his office and he tells some other people and sure enough, every time you go in that door, you end up in John Malkovich for a little while. It's hilarious and very weird and very strange. And eventually John Malkovich finds out about it. And because he's selling tickets, they decide to sell tickets. So John Malkovich finds out about it. He goes in, he gets in his own head. It's very, very strange. Again, very nearly impossible to describe. So adaptation is about Charlie Kaufman, the writer of Being John Malkovich and, and the Charlie Kaufman character, played by Nicolas Cage in this case. Uh, it, the people say, oh, I loved your last movie, Being John Malkovich, and we want to hire you for a new movie. And that new movie is uh, about orchids and the, the orchid thief, and so he's going to write a movie, and they're going to talk about the movie that he's already made, and they're going to talk about the movie that he is trying to make. And he has a fictitious twin brother, Donald. In real life, he does not, but of course, in the film, they're both played by Nicolas Cage. Again, hard to describe these movies. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind with Jim Carrey and Kate Winslet. Another very interesting film sort of circles back and around and in on itself a a love story gone sour and the Kate Winslet character decides she's going to erase Jim Carrey the Jim Carrey character from her mind she doesn't want to be dwelling about him or thinking about him and she goes to a clinic and they erase him so when he goes to see her again she has no idea who he is he decides he's going to do the same thing. Okay, all fantastic stuff. Also, Anna Melissa, which is a stop-motion film. Again, it's a kind of a romantic drama, and it is stop-motion. Yes. Okay, next up, one of my true favorites, Wes Anderson. And I apologize, there are two Andersons in our class. There's P.T. Anderson and Wes Anderson. Um, sorry, <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, I, they're completely different. It's not like they both do musicals or something like that. Um, uh, Wes Anderson, uh, a lot of his sets look like a dollhouse set. And by that, I mean, if you've ever seen an actual real dollhouse, usually the wall, the front wall comes down and you can see into all of the rooms in the dollhouse and you can pose your little dolls and things in there uh, and so his sets tend to be like that where it's sort of like a cross-section. Wes likes doing tracking shots. He has very quirky sense of humor. Uh, he likes a big cast. Um, 
uh, uh, let me see. Uh, well, the symmetrical sets, we've talked about that. He likes a big cast. Bill Murray is in, he's sort of like his good luck charm. He's in all of his movies except for the very first one where he probably could barely afford any actors. Uh, uh, Owen Wilson's in a number of the movies, Jason Schwartzman, um, uh, Kate Blanchett. Um, yeah, there's a number of people that are in a lot of his films. It's sort of like I'm making a new movie and, you know, do you want to be in it? And everybody tends to say, yes, yes, I certainly want to be in it. Um, and if you watch the trailer to The French Dispatch, it's like he's got everybody. He's got just about everybody that is a Wes Anderson actor in it. So uh, watch that trailer and you'll see. And there's a list of his, 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 his films, not in the chronological order. Uh, normally, I would be showing scenes from Moonrise Kingdom, uh, centering around two young, uh, uh, well, I hate to call them lovers, they're only 12 or 13, but they have rom or a romance, we'll call it that. Um, and a lot of those people are in it, uh, like I say, and, and uh, including... Um, Oh gosh, there's just uh, just so many. Then I'm sort of blanking on some of the names, uh, but you'll see. Uh, you'll see. Oh, Ed Norton is one of the names. He seems to be in a lot of the movies too, and he's in that one. Okay, and Royal Tenenbaums, Life Aquatic, fantastic stuff. Check them out. If you, if you like one, you would like the rest. They're they're of a, a kind, and um, they're not so different. It's kind of like the Coen Brothers and some others. If if, you know, if you like him and his style, then you would probably like just about anything he's done. And if you don't, then you probably wouldn't like any of them. I, I, I would say if you don't like Moonrise Kingdom or if you don't like the Grand Budapest Hotel, I would stop watching Wes Anderson movies because they're not going to get much different. Uh, Wes has also worked in stop motion like Tim Burton and uh, like Charlie Kaufman. So we have uh, some directors that have worked in stop motion. He has done Fantastic Mr. Fox and Isle of Dogs, or if you say it fast, Isle of Dogs. And it is set in a near future sci-fi kind of uh, Japan. And it's stop motion and all those same people. Uh, oh, Jeff Goldblum's another one of his uh, actors. So you, we're going to hear all those voices, Bill Murray and Jeff Goldblum and, and uh, all those people doing voice work. And... There are a number, and it's a gorgeous film, too. It really is gorgeous. He's done those, too. And Fantastic Mr. Fox is very good um, with uh, uh, George Clooney and Meryl Streep and Bill Murray, of course, and all the rest. So we have some stop-motion directors. Now, there are other people. There are a lot of stop-motion films out there, and they are directed by excellent directors, but they're not all feature film directors, and uh, like Tim Burton and Wes Anderson and, uh, and Charlie Kaufman. So I sort of separated them out to uh, show, and I've done that uh, through the class, uh, directors who have done black and white movies, directors who have done stop motion movies, and uh, directors who are actors and things like that. So I have little subgroupings that, I, that I'll uh, throw out at you every once in a while. And uh, so with stop motion, of course, they're little posable figures, right? They would fit in your hand and they can be moved a fraction of an inch at a time. And once you move them a fraction of an inch and click off a frame of film and move them another fraction of an inch and click off another frame of film, when you run it all together, it looks like they're moving. Uh, you might mistake them for just a regular old Pixar movie because they look like they're in 3D. They don't look like ink and paint. And they look kind of 3D, like a, like a Toy Story. But Toy Story is all done in a computer. And these stop-motion films are done by hand. A very painstaking and lengthy process. And when we get to special effects, our last class, we will talk about the granddaddy of all stop-motion movies, King Kong, and I've got a nice documentary, and you can see how they do stop-motion. Uh, 
when they used to do the big monsters, the, the, the dinosaurs and all that in stop motion. Now today they're mostly uh, these kinds of movies, like, I hate to call them Pixar movies, but animated films. They look like they're animated, and they are animated, right? They're stop motion animation. And they are fun, and you can watch those for your paper, too. You can watch any of these movies for your papers or for extra credit or anything like that. All right, so uh, next up, we have the, the last, we're going to, on our uh, second to our last class, we're going to finish off with Christopher Nolan and, and start talking about some of the superhero franchises, Marvel and DC and things like that. And then on our very last class, it will be my history of special effects or history of CGI. So uh, those are our last two classes I think they're quite good. I hope you enjoy them. In the meantime, see you next time. Take care.